And thank you very much. Beautiful, singing the Christmas carols, and singing them with uh, the blend of the praise to God. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 18 this morning, starting a new chapter. It's always a big deal. It happens occasionally. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. Pottery is one of the oldest human inventions. As soon as it was discovered, there became a, an instantaneous great demand for pottery because as a container, pottery is just superior than baskets, right? Especially when it comes to carrying liquids or water. You know, you ever tried carrying your water in a basket? Not as good as pottery, is it? Also, rodents could chew through the baskets and get to your food, but they couldn't quite do that with the pottery. Uh, so uh, right away, there was a, a whole lot of demand. Pottery is used for cooking, serving, storing food and liquids, and it's something that people use every day. Funny thing, in our family, nobody minds cooking. Actually, last Sunday, i got to tell you that James and Tony left early and went home and cooked dinner for me and Eliana. It's fantastic. It's like a pork chop thing with some red onion, and I don't even know what, but it was just great. So... Yeah, everyone likes to cook in our home. Robbie will call up mom, hey, mom, I'm making this, and I put that and that and that. So, yeah, they, she's trained these guys. I don't know about any of these you young ladies, but these guys can cook. So that's a, something to think about there. James, too. It's a pretty good catch. Uh, everyone loves eating. That's why we love cooking, because we all love eating. But, you know, the funny thing is that nobody likes to do yeah, nobody goes, man, I really can't wait to do dishes. Yeah, I'll do the mom, you rest. No. And yet eating the dishes is essential. Otherwise, the next time you want to cook and eat, you can't because everything's crusty and nasty and dirty. So God uses a common everyday item, something that everyone can relate to here in Jeremiah chapter 18 to make a point. Let's go see the potter. All right, go see the potter. That's great. And there he is. He's working on his wheel, and he's whipping out something. Uh, but the vessel he's making of clay are, was spoiled in the potter's hand, verse 4. So he remade it another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. This is a familiar scene in Jeremiah's culture, a guy spinning out wet clay uh, on a wheel and shaping it with his hands into something that looks like a useful vessel. Has anyone ever made pottery before? Anyone ever done this? Some of you have done that. Okay, very good. I, I think I would like to try that at some point in my life, I just, just to say I actually did it. My grandmother used to make ceramics. Anybody ever make ceramics? Yeah, some of you have done ceramics. So uh, uh, she would give those out as Christmas gifts to us, and, and uh, she would have lots of ceramics around the house. And it was really kind of a landmine for me to actually go visit my grandmother because she would have ornaments on every windowsill and every little shelf and, and, and ceramics all over the place. And... Uh, for those who don't know me very well, I'm kind of a bull in the china shop. I move fast and quick and abrupt, and I, you know, I sit, and then I move, and I twitch, and, and I knock her ornaments over, and it would freak Eliana out every time we go over there. She's like, sit still. Not good at that. But uh, my grandmother, she loved to make things with her hands. She, she was very crafty. She liked to sew and knit and crochet. And sometimes when she would be knitting, she would, she would be knitting, and then she'd get partway through a project and look at it, and then she would tear it all apart. Any of you gals ever done that? You were knitting something, and then you'd tear it out and trace. you pull it all apart. Why? Because there was something not quite right in the pattern, and you just had to back up and start over. And that's the same thing we see here in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 18. The potter has the wet clay on the wheel, and he starts to form an object, but the clay has some imperfections in it that affects what the potter is making, or the shape isn't quite what he had in mind. So then he smashes the object back down into a lump, and then he starts it all over again, reforming the clay into the image that he wanted it to be. No doubt this is very interesting to watch, but watching the potter craft some dishes is not the sole purpose of Jeremiah's 
field trip. God has a point he wishes to make. What is the point? Verse number five, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord, behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So as easy as it is for the potter to remold the soft clay, so the Lord can do with us. We can be remade into another vessel. In a very literal sense, God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. So even though clay here is meant to be a metaphor, the reality is the person we are much more like a lump of clay than we would originally even care to admit, right? We are made out of the dust of the earth. So God's hands are upon us, molding us and shaping us. And when we look at Scripture, we see time and time again that God remakes individuals. In the example of Joseph, he remade the prisoner and the slave into uh, Prince of Egypt. With Rahab, he remade the harlot into the mother of a line of kings. In the situation of David, the shepherd boy, he made him into the greatest king the nation of Israel had ever seen. Peter, James, and John, simple fishermen, he remade them into world-renowned evangelists. And with Paul, the murderer, he remade him into the saints. In all these examples, the remaking has definitely worked out into the favor of the individual, wouldn't you agree? But it not always works out to the favor of the individual. He also can turn kings into prisoners, as Jeremiah is telling the kings of Jerusalem. The ruler of the world, like Nebuchadnezzar, he turned him into a... What did he turn him into? Kind of like an animal, right? Just a complete, a complete dumbed-down animal. The armies of Egypt, he turned them into... Driftwood, right? See, it can go either way. He can make the rich poor and the poor rich. He can make the sick well and the well sick. He can turn everything upside down or right side up whenever, however he chooses. He can make us into whatever he pleases to make us. Well, that's really cool. Maybe God will uh, make me into what I want to be. Maybe he will give me the job and the career that I want, and he'll give me the spouse that I want, or he'll give me the home that I really want, give me all the health and the wealth that I'm hoping for. Oh yeah, he can do all that. But the verse doesn't say the potter remade the vessel as it pleased the vessel, does it? It says he remade the vessel as it pleased the, the potter. The point God is making here to Jeremiah is the power that he has over the nation. See, Israel was acting as if they had choices. Well, we can serve the gods that we want, and we can form alliances with the nations that we choose, and we can do things our way and get what we want out of life. But God's saying, no. You can't be anything other than the nation according to my plans. You cannot be anything other than what I'm purposing. Reminds me of Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah, right? Poor old Jonah. Now he is a loner. Needs a mega. No, wait, that's the Veggie Tale version. So much good teaching in there. It says, go to Nineveh and preach. And Jonah says, no! And he gets on a boat, and he goes the opposite direction. So what happens? Well, the boat encounters a storm, and Jonah gets tossed over, and he gets eaten by a fish. And at that point, you think, and I would think, if that was us, and Jonah thought, well, I'm dead. But he wasn't dead. He ended up in the belly of the fish, alive, for three days and three nights. Think about that for a moment. What's that like? What's it like in the belly of a fish? There's a lot of room in there, you know, you hang out. I mean, if you watch Pinocchio, it looks like they do the campfire and they floated a boat around. Is that what it's like in the belly of a fish? It's probably tight, eh? Suffocating. Slimy. Hot. Stinky. Uh, probably should have only lasted five minutes in there, right? Suffocated and died. You know it takes things in your stomach eight to six to eight hours to uh, digest? He's in there three days and three nights. Shouldn't he have been digested out by then? I know you didn't want to think about that thought. But I think about stuff like that. 
that's a long time. Finally, after three days and three nights, he prays. What took him so long? Wouldn't you have prayed early on? This guy's stubborn. Why? He's waiting to die. He's mad. Doesn't want to change. God won't let him die. After three days and three nights, he said, well, I guess I'm not going anywhere, so maybe I better repent. And he says, sorry, God. Stubborn man, but finally, Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That's the only way I'm going to get out of this fish. That which I have vowed, I will pay salvation. is from the Lord. And the fish vomited him up. And guess what God said? <laughs> Go to Nineveh and proclaim what I want you to proclaim. See, Jonah thought he had a choice. He could decide what he wanted to do with his life. And God said, no, you're going to go where I tell you to go. You're going to say what I tell you to say. You will be the vessel that I want you to be. Do you like that? Do you like that fact that God has that kind of control over your life? That at any given time, he can break you down and remake you into whatever he wants wasn't something that Job particularly enjoyed, was it? And yet Job said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. To be honest with you, I don't think Job is the average person. I think Job is an exceptional man with exceptional faith. I think the average person is Jonah. Do this. No! I don't want to. You know what people want to do most of the time? Nothing. Or they don't know. I don't know. Right? What, what do you want for Christmas, Rob? What do I want, Tony? I don't know. <laughs> Dad, Dad never knows what he wants, right? Well, for lunch, Eliana, where do you want to go? Where's your wife want to go to eat? I don't know. So then you decide, you make some choices. Okay, well, let's go for pizza now. Let's go for Mexican now. Let's go for Chinese now. I don't know. Don't know what I know. What I don't want. <laughs> I just don't know what I want. Right? Ask a. Uh, High school student, what do you want to do with your life? I don't know. Braden, what do you want to do with your life? I don't know. Still don't know, right? Graduated a couple years now. Ask young married couples, hey, you going to have some kids? Uh, maybe uh, a couple. That's kind of a big deal. You know, you should kind of plan that out, right? You're going to bring children into the world. And they're going to depend on you for the rest of your life. Maybe you should kind of nail that down a little bit. Eh, not sure. Ask the average person any number of questions about their plans, and more times than not, they will give you a relatively non-committal answer. All growing up, I was always looking for the path of least resistance. What's the least amount of effort I can put in? I'm not really looking to try to do anything too strenuous or hard and fail at it. I kind of want to relax, and I don't really want too much responsibilities. That kind of seems like our ultimate goal in the year. What's the biggest thing we look forward to in a year? Vacation, right? We can relax and do nothing. That's what we want to do. God has stuff for us to do, but we're not really sure we want to do it. We're not really sure why. It's just our tendency is to not want to do a lot of stuff, to be noncommittal. Not, we don't want to be too busy. You know, Eliana knew four years before I did that I was supposed to go back to seminary and work on a master's degree. It took me four years to get up on her level. Why did it take me so long? Because it was going to be a lot of work, it was going to be a lot of change, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. Do you know what? The crazy thing is, is I'm so grateful I did it. It was the greatest move I ever could have made. And I, on this side, I'm so happy I did it. But at the time, I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. And that's people. You know, I, sh I should go to church more, but yeah, you know. I, 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 we ought to get some advice. We ought to get some help with these issues. But, you know, we ought to go to Celebrate Recovery, Ted, but uh, it's going to be awkward. I don't know if I want to be that honest. You know, all these people need the Lord. All these people need help. And I could get involved and do something, but I don't know. I just don't feel like it. It's often it's just too easy to do nothing. We don't want to be stretched. But we don't have that option. Because God says, I don't want a lump of clay. I didn't create you to be a lump of do nothing. I've got these good ideas. I've got all kinds of useful things that I can make out of your life. I've got great plans. And instead of letting us do nothing and be nothing, he starts working on us. He starts spinning us around. 
and we just want to be at rest. He's turning us inside out and he's molding us and shaping us and he's pulling parts out of us that don't work and he's turning us into a vessel that pleases him. I remember back when I was in uh, Bible college, we, we had a weekly ministry requirement every semester. We had to uh, do a practical ministry. And my dad dropped me off as 18 years old in Lanham, Maryland. And uh, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any churches. I didn't know what ministry I could do. But Grace Bible Church in Seabrook, Maryland was close to the school. And they would take uh, college students in and let us serve in their ministries. And uh, they, the Awana had church ministry on Sunday nights. And I said, well, you know, I grew up doing Awana. I know all about Awana. So I guess I'll, I'll do Awana. And I started serving in the Sparkies. My junior year, a couple of twin brothers, Philip and Nathan Bryant, uh, came to transfer into Washington Bible College. And they were a few years older than me, and they are a little more mature. And uh, they, too, needed to fulfill their weekly ministry, uh, practical ministry obligation. And they, too, showed up at Grace Bible in Seabrook. But uh, they did it a little bit differently than me. They went in and actually met the pastor and introduced themselves and said to the pastor, we're here to serve. Whatever you need done, we're available to do it. So then the pastor put them to work uh, teaching a uh, teen Sunday school class. But I thought about that, and I thought about how I did it when I was a freshman, compared and contrasted uh, my approach to their approach, and I concluded, you know, they did it the right way. See, I came in at 18 years old thinking very little of myself and not wanting to do too much, not wanting to do something familiar and comfortable and minimal. And I was doing it because it was an assignment and it was an obligation. But they came in at 24 years old desiring to serve and they were studying to be in ministry and they wanted to minister and they were coming in wanting to be a blessing to the church to do whatever is needed. And that was kind of an aha moment for me. Once I saw them do that, I realized that's the proper attitude. And I lack that. See, I'm always watching people, how they conduct themselves, and, and I'm always evaluating, asking myself, is that better or worse than, than how I do things? When it's, when it's better, it challenges me, right? Uh, I, I, they, they're doing better. I could do better. And when my peers are doing worse, it makes me complacent because I go, well, you know, I may be doing too much, but I'm not as bad as Bobby over there, you know. That's, that's a relief. <laughs> So the Bryant brothers, they made me think about my attitude. Their attitude was the right one, and I didn't have that attitude. And now as a pastor, I have people like the Bryant brothers here. They say, Pastor, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know, a couple years back, I was like, John, I, you've been teaching this Sunday school class for a while. I need someone to do this one-on-one -on -one stuff. He says, you just tell me where I need to go. Not literally like that, but you know what I mean. Like, whatever ministry you need me to put me in, and I'll do it. And that was just grateful. So there's a servant's heart, the right attitude. But we also have people around here like uh, young Rob who are not really trying to do too much. You know, what's the least I can do? Ministry isn't about what I want to do. It's not about being the vessel that I want to be. It's about being what God wants me to be, doing what he's designed me to do. You see, I didn't know back in 1992 that God in, was molding me and shaping me to be what I am now. I'll tell you right now, in 1992, I was, never thought I would be preaching sermons every week. But once you get it through your head that it's not about what you want to do with your life, it's what God wants. And now you and God are on the same page. So verse number six, you can read this and you can insert your own name in here. Can I not, oh Rob McNutt, deal with you as the potter does? Can I not, oh Tony McNutt, can I not, Abigail Brown, do with you as the potter does with the clay. Behold like clay in the potter's hands, Faith Bible. Whoever you are, put your name in there. So are you. But think about this now, because the skilled potter doesn't take the clay and say, I think I'm just going to make some broken junk today. I just want to waste my time making stuff that's useless. Is that what the potter does? The skilled potter always turns something out that's functioning, useful, works great, and generally speaking, is a work of art, right? These guys have been doing this for a long time. They make some amazing, priceless stuff. And that is God's intention for your life. may not be what you are now. may not be how you see yourself, but that doesn't matter because it's not how we see ourselves. It's how 
God sees us. And God tends to see us as so much more than we see ourselves. So what you have to do is trust him, trust the molding and shaping process. And then there's some of us who think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And uh, we think that we're already perfectly formed vessels when we're still just a lump of clay, but that's okay because we're all going to learn otherwise as the master takes us and starts molding us and shaping us. And we go, hey, hey, thought it was good. No, you're just at the beginning stage. What is his molding and shaping process? Well, God created everything how? By speaking, right? The power of his word. He spoke, let there be, and so it was. And he speaks into our lives through his word. It says, let a man examine himself, judge yourself. Blessed is the man who, cursed is the man who, thou shalt, thou shalt not. All these things that God is telling us to do and be is God molding and shaping us. All the experiences that we go through and our reactions, our responses to them is God molding and shaping us. All the good people that God has placed in our lives are people that we're learning from that he's using to mold and shape us and all the pain that we go through is molding and shaping us. And the Bible stories affirm this for us, doesn't they? When you look at, uh, for example, young David, right? And David goes out to face uh, Goliath, the giant. And uh, what was his argument? What was his rationale for why King Saul should let him uh, attack, uh, fight the giant? He said, well, when uh, the lion came to attack my flock, uh, God delivered the lion into my hand. And when the bear came to attack the flock, God delivered the bear into my hand. So just like that lion and just like that bear, so the Lord God of Israel will give that uncircumcised Philistine into my hand. He can protect me from lions and bears. He can protect me from this. And I'm sure, you know, on the day that that lion attacked David's flock, he didn't go, woohoo, I get to fight a lion today. Yeah. Think he was intimidated? Maybe a little scared? Not real comfortable, right? But that crisis was used to prepare him. Everything you're dealing with is something that God is using to mold you and shape you. All you have to do is recognize that it's okay. It's all being used for God's glory and for God's good. So, you know, I look around at what's transpiring in the, in the nation and in the world, and much, much of it concerns me, and, and I know there's a lot of immorality and there's a lot of injustice and wickedness abounds and hate is strong and greed and deception is rampant, but I'm not downhearted or discouraged because God has said, can I not, O host of Israel, can I not, O America, deal with you as the potter does? Declares the Lord, behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, pull it down, or destroy it. If that nation against which I've spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring upon it. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build it up and to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good which, with which I promise to bless it. So now then. Speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning calamity against you, and I'm devising a plan against you. O oh, turn back, each of you, from his evil way, and reform your ways and your deeds. God will build up a leader, a movement, a nation, or he'll take it down in his way and his time. Think about the politics the day that Jesus was born, right? Who was ruling the world? Rome, particularly ruling the nation of Israel, right? Rome was uh, over them and in control. We know uh, from Luke's account that Caesar had given a decree that all the world should be taxed. It meant that everyone had to travel to their pl place of origin. So that meant Mary and Joseph had to travel from Galilee to Bethlehem, right? And that was a 100-mile journey. And they didn't have a Ford Explorer to take it in, right? They had, to, they had to walk. You know how long that would take? Eight to ten days. Take eight to ten days. And pregnant, I don't know how long that would take because I've never been pregnant and walked. To be honest with you, I've never walked 100 miles anyways. So 
probably take me 40. That's not ideal circumstances, but that was God's plan. The puppet king that Rome had set over the land of, of, of Israel, Herod. Herod wasn't a true Jewish king. He definitely didn't love the people or try to defend them. On the contrary, when he got worried about the baby Jesus, he killed all the babies in the Bethlehem region to protect his power. That's not an ideal circumstance, but God knows all this is going to happen. And later on, he uses the Roman Empire to crucify his son. So whether a nation is wicked or righteous, it doesn't matter. God can use it, and God will use it. Now, we ought to hope and pray that we could be a righteous nation, for as we see here, there are consequences for being an evil nation, that he will tear it down, and he will bring calamity. The evil can turn to good and be blessed. The blessed can turn to evil and lose the blessing. But either way, it's not without design, which gives me full assurance in this passage. All things... Work together for good. All things work together for good. This phrase here in, in verse number four really jumped out at me when I, when I was reading through this and preparing this message. The, the last phrase there. As it pleased the potter to make. As it pleased the potter to make. Remind me of another passage spoken by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 15, verse 53, verse number 10. But it pleased the Lord to crush him. What was that spoken of, remember? That's spoken to Jesus, right? That's Messianic prophecy. It pleased the Lord to crush His Son. That was His plan and His means of our redemption. Many times it is the painful things that bring about our redemption. The Christmas story is such a beautiful message of peace on earth and goodwill to men, but it came through the pain and sorrow of childbirth. The babe in the manger, we love that scene so very much. We put it up here and we say, oh, isn't that nice? But that, that trial was because there was no place else to go. It wasn't ideal. It's through the pain and the desperation of that night that God came to us, Emmanuel, God with us. And so often, brothers and sisters, the way God comes to us today and the way he speaks to our children to draw them back to himself. And the way that he molds a nation to be what he desires it to be is through pain and desperation. Speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants, saying, Thus says the Lord, I am fashioning calamity against you, devising a plan against you. God's evil and God's calamity, he's preparing for Israel, isn't out of hate. It is a measure of discipline because... He's got a plan for good for Israel, and Israel's going to fall in line, whether they want to or not. As it pleased him, he says in verse number four. That's an uncomfortable statement, but that's where we have to go. That's where we all have to go in our relationship with God and in our faith. We have to go to the place where we're not doing what we want and what we like and our lives are, are, are about pleasing ourselves. No, we have to get to the understanding and the practice of authentic biblical faith that says, my life is a sacrifice and I'm here to be used according to God's good pleasure. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is Gain, and Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. But fear not, child of God, if and when you come to that place of surrendered obedience, what the potter is making for you is not a mess. What the potter is going to make out of you is something wonderful, something precious, something pleasing in his sight. So as many of you today are sitting on that potter's wheel this morning and you're being spun round and round and you feel like your life is spinning out of control, it's not. The potter's hands are on you. And this is all going to turn out exactly as he wants it. Lord Jesus, we pray that we could trust you through the trials and the pain and the frustration, through the losses and the sorrow, through the hurts, through the things that we didn't want to have happen. But they're happening. And we don't like it. But you won't take it away. Pray that we can trust you through this. Knowing that you, the potter, are molding and shaping according to your perfect plan and your perfect will for our lives. We won't think that we are already oh so great and perfect as the lump of clay. But we will just go through the process 
trusting your word, letting ourselves be turned out through grace. Like Craig spoke here today, even about how he had the, the Holy Spirit came in here and settled him down. He was acting out crazy, and he wanted to just make a big mess of things. And you came in and settled him down. And you had a plan for that moment in the hospital. You had a divine appointment. May we look for those in all things, Lord. Not our will, but yours be done. We pray all this in Jesus' name.